Okay. Thank you, Father God, that we can come before you, Lord, your family of believers, Lord, trusting in you, believing and hoping in you, Lord God. For in this world we have nothing, Lord. We know that our all in all is in you. Father, I pray for this family out in Oklahoma, Lord, that you would be with the people that are there, Lord, in the passing of this man. And, Lord, that you would comfort them. And, Lord God, that you would just, in a, in a mighty way, just minister to them by your spirit, Lord. I pray for each of our families, Lord God. Yes, I pray Lord. that bless Carlos and Kathy and their family and Ed and Johnny O and and uh, all of them, Lord God. You know us, Lord God, by name. You know our heart. You know our uprising and our downsetting, Lord God. You know everything about us, Lord God. And, Lord God, you, you know how to bless us, Lord God. You know what we need, Lord God. And we don't even know what to ask, Lord, when we pray, but your Spirit maketh intercession for us, Lord God. And you know what we need, Lord God, and you do provide for us abundantly above all that we could ask or hope. Lord, we do pray for divine health. Lord God, we know that we are frail, that our life is but a vapor, and and except you, Lord God, keep us as the apple of your eye, Lord God, and just touch us when we need to be touched in our bodies, Lord God, and heal us of our many infirmities, Lord God. And many are the afflictions of the righteous, but Lord, you know how to deliver us out of them all, Lord God. And you are a way maker, Lord God. And you go before us and you keep us, Lord. Lord, let us not buy into what's going on in in this nation and in the world, Lord God. But in this nation, Lord God, this political event that's taking place, Lord God, help us to just pray and believe you, Lord God, that you will keep us. Lord God, there are cities that are at unrest, Lord God, and And there's an attack, Lord God, from the enemy, and we know who our enemy is, Lord God. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Lord God. We know who the enemy is, and Lord, we thank you for giving us the victory. Lord, no matter what happens in this world, we we know that we are in a kingdom, Lord God, your kingdom. And that in this world, Lord God, we have nothing. Lord, we... We just pray, Lord, that while we're here, Lord, you would be able to use us, Lord, as a light and as a witness, Lord God, to those around us, Lord, in the churches that we go to, the people that we know, the people that we meet, Lord God. And when men's hearts are just failing them for the fears to come, and Lord, even as your word says, the perplexity and the distress of the nations, Lord God, as we see this roundabout, Lord God, let our faith not waver or fail but help us to be steadfast confident in the faith lord that you've called us with lord god lifting up men in prayer and praying for your spirit to be poured out lord that many would turn to you lord i believe that the enemy come in like a flood but lord you're able to raise up a standard lord god in our midst and in the midst of America. Lord God, put a boldness in your people and in your leaders, Lord God, those that are preachers of righteousness, Lord God, that they would declare your love, Lord God, and how we should walk, Lord God, not by sight, but in faith, Lord God, and in love, Lord, towards you and to the brethren and to those that are without, Lord God, and do not know you, Lord God. Lord, I know that There is so much going on in this world now that the time is short. And, Lord God, we do look for your soon appearing when you shall appear, Lord God, and we shall be with you. But, Lord, while we're here, help us to do thy will, Lord God, here on this earth. Father God, I ask this in Jesus' name. And by the blood of the Lamb, Lord God, by which we are saved, Lord God, watch over us. Keep our household safe. Lord, when we're on the road and in our cars, Lord God, Lord God, that you'll just watch over us and give us traveling mercies, Lord God. Lord God, that we will be more than overcomers through you that have loved us, Lord God, and called us with a heavenly calling. We thank you, Lord God, hallelujah, for you work mightily in us to do of your good will, Lord God. 
We thank you. We praise you. We extol you, Lord God, for your name is high above the heavens. Your name is great in all the earth, Lord. And we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord, for what you have done for us, for having loved us first while we were yet sinners, and having called us out of the world that we might walk in your light. Thank you, Lord God, for all that you're doing. Lord God, we just praise you and thank you for it. Amen. Amen. Let me add, I, I gave the report about Ken and Cindy going up to see his, bro, uh, his sister and brother-in-law. And let's lift them up in prayer. And remember that Bob is not saved. He's not serving. That's His brother-in-law is not saved. He's not serving the Lord. And so let's uh, pray for them. Lord, we just pray that you would touch them, Lord. Yes. Whatever the physical conditions are, you know, Lord. I pray that you'd work everything out, mighty God. And particularly in Bob's life, I pray that you would use this time. I, I pray that you would speak to his heart the way that Ken and Cindy have uh, sacrificed to drive up there to help them out, that it would touch their hearts, that they would see the love of God in Ken and Cindy, and that Bob might be moved to turn to you, Lord. Please touch his heart right now. And lead him to repentance, Lord, that he might know the goodness of God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, brethren. Well, let's uh, pick up where, where we left off. We, we're about halfway through the the uh, 13th chapter of Corinthians, the, the love chapter, the charity chapter. And, uh, you know, it seems like... <clears throat> A lot of people think like, well, you know, I know what love is all about. You know, I know what charity is. And, you know, but the truth is, it's a lot more. Uh, you know, a lot of people equate, well, the love of God is, you know, giving your, you know, your goods to the poor. But we just read in the opening verses that though I give my goods to feed the poor, you know, though I give it all and I don't have charity. So a lot of times we equate certain actions with charity, and yes, it's true, but it's not necessarily truly the love of God working in people. Just because they give doesn't mean that that's really the love of God. And, and I know it's perplexing a lot, a lot of people, but it really, it really is a question of we're talking about the motivations of our heart. I will say this, that uh, I, I don't know about you all, but and you know what? I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. If you want to chime in and, and, you know, say something, just unmute yourself just so that we have uh, the, the background noise uh, eliminated. So let me mute everybody now and then just unmute yourselves. For those of you that are on the phones instead of the computer, just I think it's star six, uh, and you can unmute yourself. All right, let me mute everybody. So I know that uh, I used to think I knew what love was. Before I came to the Lord, you know, I was all in the love movement, the hippie, you know, you love everybody. You know, I don't want war. I mean, I thought I knew what love was, and but I had a very wrong conception of it. You know, I used to think that if I loved my brother, well, I would turn him on to, you know, give him drugs, you know, help him to get high and feel good and, that's not the love of God. That's not love. That's detrimental to a person. True love is not detrimental to others. So in the course of our studying this chapter, we're going to, we, we're, and, and, it's, and, and again, as time goes on in our walk, the more you read it, the more sense it will make, the, more you'll, the better you'll understand it, the better you'll come to understand what the true love of God is working in us. So many of the the things that Paul is describing in this chapter are what love is not, are, is what charity is not. Oftentimes, you can uh, best define what something is by describing what it is not. And uh, so that's what he's done a lot with these descriptions. But we did read verse uh, 5 last week. It says, uh, it does not love charity, does not behave itself unseemly, it seeketh not her own is not easily provoked and thinketh no evil. And uh, I want to finish with that part that, about thinketh no evil, because I think it's, it's important. 
I don't. We don't have Cindy to read tonight, so I don't know. Ed, are, are you up to reading? And is your yeah. mic working? Yeah. Good? yeah. Okay. I can, I can read. Um, you you got to share your screen too. Oh yeah, that would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. All right, hang on one second. I'll, Just I'll, me a... I'll read as long as it's coming through on the phone, okay? Okay, perfect. All right. Well, I, what I'd like to do, tell me when you see the screen, it, yeah, just pick I can it up. Yeah, Second Corinthians. Okay, if you'll just pick it up, it thinketh no evil. That's one of the, uh, you know, characteristics of charity or of the love of God. So if you'll read that section, thinketh no evil and uh, scripture. Okay. Thinketh no evil does not mean that we won't ever have evil thoughts because our minds are the battleground and we will continually have to reject the evil that the enemy seeks to have us dwell on. But we let's not to give unto <laughs> let's not give unto There you go. Okay. Um there you go. But let's not give in to those evil thoughts. Second Corinthians ten verses four and five. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So the reason I wanted to pick up on this and, and you know emphasize it once again is that look brethren we are you know we are in a battle day in and day out with the powers of darkness and they have the ability to interject thought into our minds to influence our thoughts. And, uh, you know, it's it's hard, it's difficult to understand that, but as you walk with the Lord, you, you see that plainly that that's what happens all the time. So when he says, thinketh no evil, it's not just about that we, you know, we don't plan evil against people or anything, but it's like we don't give in to the thought patterns that the powers of darkness would like us to engage in. You just nip it in the bud. And so 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, it tells you how to, you cast down the imaginations. You don't give them place. The enemy puts stuff in your brain and says, I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to entertain this stuff in my head. You know, so we want to bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. So it is, it's not easy. It's a battle. But, you know, with God's help and his grace, we will do it. Okay, if you'll pick it up in verse 6, and I think we read this as well, but let's go ahead and cover it again as we finish this chapter off. Uh, okay. Uh, chapter uh, 13, 6. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Remember that iniquity is more than just lawlessness. As we have noted, Lucifer was found to have iniquity in his heart, and it was pride and self-exaltation. We cannot rejoice in those who are proud and arrogant. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. To rejoice in the truth is to find satisfaction, fulfillment. When we see the word of truth is upheld because that is how iniquity is overcome. Proverbs 16:6. 6, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Psalm 119:9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Okay, so okay. this is <clears throat> the idea that we don't rejoice in iniquity, but we rejoice in the truth. Love will never, the love of God will never rejoice in that which is iniquity. And, uh, and the things that I was pointing out here about pride and arrogancy, you know, when we see this in people, 
let's not let's not mistake that for the anointing of God. I, I was talking about this last week, and I just want to reiterate it. There's a lot of times that we see people ministering, and they they seem to to, to minister with such authority. But you know, it's one thing. There isn't there is the authority of love, the authority of the love of God manifesting itself. And then there's the authority of the flesh, of carnality. And what is it? The carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. It, it is, and, and those that are in the flesh that are carnal cannot please God. And what I'm saying by that is that when you see this pride and arrogancy in the pulpit, that's not the love of God working. That is flesh. That's carnality. And, I, you know, I, I can only say that many times early on in my walk, I mistook this. I thought that the, that the people that were speaking in pride and arrogancy for the Lord, for Jesus, were, that, that was, they were anointed. I was greatly mistaken. It took the Lord some time to teach me the reality of that. I will give you a quick, I, I don't think I mentioned this last week, but I will mention it this week, that in the uh, early and mid-70s when Jimmy Swaggart was the darling of Pentecostalism and Charismatics, and he was viewed as to be as the representative of all that was godly. And, I mean, people just almost worshipped him. And I can remember back in those days, uh, you know, I, at first I was taken with his ministry, but then I began to under, to see the pride and the arrogancy. This was before that he, he fell, or before it was made known that he'd fallen. And uh, I can remember having a conversation with uh, a friend of mine who 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 was went on to become a an evangelist with the Assemblies of God. And in the course of conversation, talking about Jimmy Swaggart, I said to him, I said, you know, he was commenting how much he admired Jimmy Swaggart, and he and I had gone out to Jimmy Swaggart's church that he just built out there in Louisiana and in, uh, in Baton Rouge, I think it was. And, uh, and we're having this conversation about him. And I said, well, look, Jimmy, I understand that this is, you know, someone that you respect. But I'm telling you, something is not right. There is something wrong with this man. And, oh, my goodness, he took such offense to it. And it wasn't but a year. Within that year, it came to light, the whole problem that he had. And, look, brethren, it's, it's like the same thing that happened to King David on that rooftop, when he looked at Bathsheba, I think, it, you know, in his heart, the devil, we're talking about the evil thought, you know, the, the devil came and said to him, you know, hey, King David, you're the king. These, this is all your rule, everything. And look, her, you know, her husband's away to battle. Uh, you know, it, she's one of your servants. Uh, it's no big deal. You're entitled. You're God's man. You're the king. You're the anointed of the Lord. And, you know, David gave into that nonsense. And, you know, we know the whole story. So a lot of people point to that fall of David as, you know, uh, the hypocrisy of religion. But what I want to say about King David, because it says that he was a man after God's own heart, and we understand this not because he fell. No, that, that wasn't the reason he was after God's own heart. We know that. But the fact that when he was confronted with his sin, he did acknowledge it, and he repented of it. And how do we know that David repented of it? And how do we know that he really was a man after God's own heart? Because the record shows that David never again committed that act. He never again, you know, went and laid with another man's wife. He didn't have someone else cold-bloodedly murdered. He truly repented. He adjusted his ways. That doesn't make what he did right, doesn't justify it, but it does give us an insight into the fact that the mercy of God is everlasting. And if a person truly repents of his sin and does not want to commit it anymore, that God is willing and able and will do that work in their heart. Love, charity does not rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in the truth. We don't rejoice in the fact that David fell. 
We rejoice in the fact that he recovered himself and didn't go back and commit the sin. We rejoice in the truth. So we, we don't like pride and arrogancy, and we don't want to give in to it in our lives, that's for sure. Anybody want to add anything before we go on? And please feel free to. Remember, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, then let's pick it up in verse 7, if you would, Ed. Okay. Verse 7, Sareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, beareth all things. We don't achieve this overnight. We grow into this through trials and tribulations. They are worked into us as we go through these trying situations, we learn that it is possible to bear all things, but it's because we trust that God will bring us through, as we have seen him always do. Believe it's all things. This is a relative term. We don't believe what is not the truth. We cannot believe in a lie because no lie is of the truth, First John 2.21. Hope is all things. We give the benefit of the doubt, but we hope in the things that God can do, not what man might do. Endureth all things. It goes along with beareth all things. We have to hang in there by hoping all things. And this is the goal that we endure until the end. Matthew 10, 22, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. James 1.12, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. The only way we can endure to the end is if the love of God, charity, is established within our hearts. That love will cast out all fear. First John 4.18 There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now there's something that I wanted to emphasize here that I didn't last week, and uh, <clears throat> about enduring all things, that like with beareth all things, you have to grow into this. The only way that you can learn to endure all things, that charity can enable you to do that, is to go through it. You're going to be subjected to stuff. And uh, when it comes to, like Matthew 22, it says, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. This is something critical in our days. Okay, so when you read... Uh, for example, some of the end time prophecy regarding, you know, like Matthew 24 and Luke 21. And uh, th there is something in there that Jesus says. You know, he says that there's the beginning of sorrows, which, you know, we all know about earthquakes and wars and rumors of war. They're all the beginning of sorrows. And then he says, then you're going to be delivered up, uh, uh, you know, and some of you will be killed, he said. Uh, and this is something that instills fear in the heart of man because we have this, you know, for obvious reasons, God has given us the the uh, drive to of self-preservation. So the idea that we would be, our lives would be put in jeopardy, it instills fear in us. But charity, it will cast out all fear. And that is going to come about by the relationship that God develops between you and him as you learn about him and you will learn to trust him that he will see you through every situation even though you may not understand how but you learn by going through the, the, the situation that he will somehow with time the more you go through it the more you see his hand at work and there there's one other thing that I I was reading the other day about the end times not only are you going to be delivered up, but it says that in, in a place it says, uh, then shall they put you out of the synagogues. Now, wh why, that's why that was important for me is that I realized that when Jesus was saying that, 
there were no such thing as churches then, right? The church had, hadn't really even started yet. Remember, he's just getting the disciples ready for the church uh, about to take off. But all they knew were synagogues. But in our day, in the church, there, there's, not, there's churches. And he says, they're going to put you out of the synagogues, meaning that if you're looking at it in last day's terms, they're going to be putting you out of the churches. Why that is critical is because, brethren, if you stand for the truth, if you don't rejoice in iniquity and you rejoice in the truth, if you stand up for the truth, people in the churches today are not going to be happy with you. They're going to want to drive you out. They're going to not like because you're a conviction upon them. But if, you're, if you'll speak the truth in love, God will be pleased with you. They might drive you out of the synagogues. They might drive you out of the churches. But it's okay, because we are about pleasing God and not pleasing man. I'm reminded of that scripture in John 12, where it says that many of the priests in the temple believed on Jesus. It says they believed on him but they refused to confess him before men for fear of being put out of the synagogue, out of the temple. They loved the praises of men more than the praises of God. And we don't want to do that. We don't care what men think about us. We care about what God thinks about us. So we're going to have to endure to the end. We're going to have to endure all these things, being put out of the churches, being criticized, mocked, being accused of not having the love of God, when in fact it's all about we're doing everything that we're doing is because we do have the love of God and we do care about men's souls, but we're going to be accused as not having the love of God. You need to be well grounded in the word and have that good relationship with the living God so that these things will never sway you in any way. False accusations. They don't know what true charity is. We know, and we're learning it better and better all the time. So we're going to have to endure all things. Anybody want to add anything before we go on here? Okay, Ed, if you'll pick it up in verse 8. Okay. Verse 8. Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Prophecy of God doesn't fail. Paul is stating that it will not be needed once it is all fulfilled. It will have served its purpose. Tongues will not be needed once we're in heaven, as is most probably referenced here in Zephaniah 3.9. It's not that all knowledge will vanish, but the former knowledge that will not be a part of heaven. Revelation 21, 4, 5, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. But charity never fails, because it will endure on into heaven. And so it is charity that we should seek to have fulfilled in us, not prioritizing whether we are prophetic or have the gifts operating in our lives, Paul is making it clear that charity is the priority. Okay, now, listen to me. How many times have you heard over the years these ministries that are prioritizing that they're prophetic ministries, and how important the prophetic ministry is, as though this was really what really mattered? Well, what is the Word of God saying right here? Of course prophecy matters, but it's not the priority. And yet you have ministers that are making it the priority. Oh, well, we have a prophetic ministry, and therefore our ministry is really super important. 
more important than anybody else's ministry. Yes, we are at the tip of the spear. We're the head and not the tail. I mean, come on, brethren. Let's not listen to this pride and arrogancy emanating from the pulpits of, of you know of America and the world. Let's let's learn to have our focus on what's truly important. Are these people who are saying all these things? What about the fruits in their lives? Is it truly the the charity of God that they're manifesting? Because as far as I can see, particularly from this chapter. This is what matters, not whether we have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and, and have all knowledge. No, the, the priority is, do you have the love of, do you understand what the love of God is? And do you have that love working in you? Because that's really what matters. So all knowledge is not going to pass away. I mean, it does say that uh, here that, that knowledge, it shall vanish away. But obviously, it's not all knowledge. It's certain, certain things that won't, we won't need them anymore. It says in another place that in heaven the former things will not come to mind because we won't need that stuff anymore. But do you think that we're not going to have knowledge from that point on? Oh, of course we are. No, God wants us to have the knowledge of God. You know, there's, so it's just, again, it's about rightly dividing the word of truth, prioritizing that it's charity is the priority, really is. Okay, uh, verse 9 and 10, if you would. If, does anybody want to add anything before we go on? Okay, if you'll pick up in verse 9 and 10. Ed. Okay, okay, verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. We only know what God allows us to know, and that is only a partial understanding. And prophetic things are also given to us with a limited understanding. For example, one prophet was given a certain revelation, like where Jesus would be born, Micah 5, 2. Another was given that Jesus would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7:14. And still another would be born of the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49:10, etc., etc. No one man was given the whole revelation, but to each a part. So it continues. We will know in part, but only what the Lord deems important for us to know. What we shall know, but we shall know all things He wants us to know. First John two twenty, but you shall you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. But brethren, this does not mean literally all things. It means what God will give us to know all things that pertain to life and godliness. Second Peter one three, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. But it comes through the knowledge of him, getting to know the Lord intimately is what matters, not figuring out all the mysteries. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So what is Jeremiah 9, 23, and 24 basically saying? It's like, get your priorities right. The same thing that, that Paul is saying in, in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Get your priorities right. You know, don't let, don't glory in your wisdom and what, how much you've learned and how much, you know, don't, you know, glory in how strong and how much you're able to endure and all of that. Don't glory in how much you've accumulated and, you know, your business acumen and all that. No. 
glory in this, that you have a relationship with the true and living God, and you are learning what true charity is, because God is love. He is charity. To know him is to know what charity is. So glory in that you understand and know him, that you have that relationship with him. That is the biggest priority. And again, not that you were that you operate in the gifts. The whole reason we're talking about this chapter was because in the previous chapter, when Paul discussed the gifts of the Spirit, he ended the chapter by saying, look, I want you not to be ignorant of these spiritual gifts and to, yes, desire those, particularly to, to the edifying of the body. He said, let that be your God. And I'm going to show you a more excellent way, how, how to really understand the gifts and operate in them. Is It's charity. And charity is knowing the Lord. It's coming to that place in your walk where you're not, you don't think that you dictate to the Lord what gifts you're to operate in and how you're to be used of him. No, it's understanding that the gifts are his and they're under his control and that we're just here to be used of him as he sees fit. I can tell you one thing, as a young Christian, when I was really preoccupied with the gifts and knowledge, uh, you know, I had just gone to Haiti. John o was there with me. And, I, you know, we were forced to have to learn how to minister. Not only were we going around in churches to, to give our testimonies and preach the word of God, and we preached on a radio program in Haiti there every, every you know, every Monday through Friday. We all took turns doing that. But we also had to give Bible studies amongst ourselves. We were forced to. It was everyone had to do it. <clears throat> and so naturally, being a young Christian, you get caught up in that, you know, you want to operate in the gifts and you want to have all knowledge. And, and so I can remember picking up a book by Watchman Nee. I think you've all heard me say this before, but it, it bears repeating. And as I read this book, because I wanted to have knowledge, I wanted to learn how to minister. I wanted to learn how to operate in the gifts. And I'm reading this book, and it's just so confusing. It's, it's pure intellectualism, and it, it's not enough about the Word of God. It really isn't. And in my confusion, I remember the Holy Ghost speaking to me one day as I was reading the book, and he said, put the book down. I remember laying it on my chest, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me, I want you to read my Word. I will teach you what you need to know when you need to know. Okay, that, ha that has been many, many years ago. And I will tell you that God has been faithful to teach me what I need when I need to know it. Mike Nevin, who is, I'm, I don't know if he's on the call yet tonight, but, you know, he and I and, and Andrew used to be involved on a call with uh, a lot of Messianic believers, some of the prominent name teachers in the movement. And uh, they would pose uh you know, things out of the Word of God to prove their points, which are totally against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And brethren, I want you to know that there were times when the Lord would wake me up in the middle of the night and give me the scriptures that I needed in order to combat what they were presenting. And, and Mike and Andrew can attest to some of those arguments that were put forth. And they, how could they resist what was written in the Word? Nevertheless, they, they did. They would try to resist it. But what the point that I'm making is that God will never fail us, brethren. If we, if we want to know him, if we want to glory in him, he will always teach us what we need to know, when we need to know it. And we just have to be patient and, and just hang in there. He'll teach us when it's time. It's precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, line upon line. He'll never fail us. Okay, so, uh, you know, back to this thing. It says, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Let's understand that we're always going to only understand in part. The point that I gave here about how that in the Old Testament, the Lord never gave to just one individual. I mean, he could have done it. He could have sat down with Moses and says, look, this is where Jesus is going to be born. He's going to be born of a virgin. He's going to come out of the tribe of Judah. He didn't do that. That doesn't say that God might not have revealed it to him, but we don't know that. I would say that that wasn't revealed to him. But we understand that over a period of time, God chose different men to reveal different things. And he does that so that we all are interdependent upon one another 
and ultimately dependent upon him. You know, these men, Micah, Isaiah, all the prophets of old, they sought the Lord, and in seeking the Lord, the Lord revealed to them what he wanted to them to know at that time. And it all worked together for the big picture. We, who are down the line, look back on all these things that was revealed to them, and we see how perfect the hand of God was. Well, today, he's doing the same thing with all of us, brethren. He gives me a little bit of revelation. He gives you a little bit of revelation. And we share amongst one another, comparing spiritual with spiritual. And we end up rejoicing in the Lord that he uses us all. And he confirms us all one with another. Because it's the one spirit working in us all to bring forth the one truth, the one gospel, which is the one Lord and the one God who Father of all. It's only one. Not a you know, a bunch of different things. So, um, you have an unction from the Holy One. You know all things. Well, you you know all things in relation to what God wants you to know. <laughs> you know, obviously, uh, we don't know it all. And, and we're going to keep talking about that here a little bit. If you'll pick it up in verse 11, Ed. All right. Verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. When were we children? Well, as in the natural, we were newborn babes when we were born again of the Spirit, and we began to grow as we ate of the mouth of the Word. First Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. But we cannot continue to be a child. We must grow into maturity. But as we just read, that can only happen if we are studying the Word and putting it into practice. James 1.22, but you be doers of the Word and not, <clears throat> excuse me, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And because many Christians do not obey the word, they do not grow into maturity. What would you think Paul is describing as childish things? I think it's about being misguided and trying to figure out things that are clearly not given to us to figure out, such as the many mysteries of the kingdom of God. For example, Jesus tells us, that no man can know the hour or the day when he returns and the end will be. Matthew twenty four thirty six. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jesus, when speaking of the signs of the end time, said this, Luke twenty one twenty eight. 28. And when these things begin to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Jesus did not say, try to figure out when these things will come to pass. He said, when these things begin to come to pass. These are spoken to reassure us that when they are occurring, we should not be troubled, because these signs are to encourage us that the end is near. And yet, like obstinate children, many insist that even though the Lord clearly stated, it is not for you to know. Acts 1, 7. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father has put in his own power. Nevertheless, some are determined to prove they can figure out when all these things will happen. They waste time on things that cannot profit. They should be concentrating on those things that will cause them to grow in the knowledge of God and will enable them to discern between good and evil. Hebrews 5:13 and 14. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 
but such growing in the word of righteousness to learn discernment. If we remain babes, children, we remain vulnerable. Ephesians 4, 14 and 15, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So what kind of cunning craftiness and slight of men do they do? Slight of men, it's like, let's divert your attention from what the priority is to these other things like, of like, you know, gain is godliness. Give so that you can get a hundredfold. Or, you know, hey, come on and learn to be prophetic. You know, because it's really important that you be prophetic that you operate in the gifts of the Lord. You know, look, I'm not discounting that they're the gifts of the Lord or that prophecy is not important, uh, you know. But what I am saying is let's not, the slight of men, don't let them change the priority for you. Don't let them, because it's happened to me early in my walk. I was so preoccupied with, well, well, if I'm, if I'm if I'm going to be growing in the Lord, I got to learn how to work in the gifts of the Lord. I you know I've got I've got to I've got to have these things happen. Otherwise, I'm not growing. Oh my goodness, what a lie! I was fed, and my priorities were were very wrong. When I was really supposed to be learning about what the love of God is and how to operate in the love of God, that's the more perfect way. That's the way you'll see God be able to use you and, and, and to be able uh, to be uh, a blessing to others. We have to have the, the love of God revealed in our hearts. So it's about what he said. Let's go back to the scripture. He said, uh, as new, not, not that one, I'm sorry. He said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. I know what that, I, as, as, a, as a spiritual child, I was so preoccupied with knowing the mysteries and, you know, understanding all knowledge. And I didn't prioritize about having the love of God formed in me. I just thought that that was just automatically happens. I didn't know that I had to devote myself to it. I mean, this is what Paul is trying to tell us here in this chapter. He's saying, look, brethren, this is what you need to focus on. Well, why is he trying to get our attention? Because this is what we need to be pre preoccupied with, not the other things. Those things will happen automatically as we have the love of God, the cherry, the knowledge of God. That, the other things will just happen as God deems it to happen, not as we want it to happen. That, that's important. Anybody want to add anything as we get ready to go on here? And, and again, pointing out these things like uh, where Jesus said, it's not for you to know. And yet, you know, so many brethren have gotten caught. I've gotten caught up in it early on, trying to figure it all out. When, when is this going to happen? When is it gonna... It's not for you to know the times of the seasons, he said. You can't get any plainer than that. Jesus is saying, don't waste your time. Don't allow your attention to be misguided. Don't let the powers of darkness rob you. Spend your time on the things that count. And yet we have so many people out there in the so-called ministry trying to, you know, point out this, how important it is to figure out the chronology of everything. And no, it's, it's look, little by little, just to know it'll be revealed, let's, Look at what the Word of God says is our priority. So don't make the mistake to think that, well, the love of God is just going to automatically happen in my life. Yes, God is going to work it, but you have to pursue it. You have to ask. You have to seek if you're going to find. you got to knock on the door and let him know, Lord, I want the love of God formed in me. I want the love of God perfected in me. 
That's our responsibility. Okay, so we want to grow. We want to grow, not stay as children, and a good indication of growing into maturity is that we have our senses exercised to discern both good and evil. As you grow in the knowledge of God, as you grow in the understanding of his word, when you see men out there with the slight of hand or slight of word, however you want to do it, you all of a sudden you go, oh, yeah, I, that, that's not the Holy Ghost. Now, when we were babes, when we were children, they could pull the wool over our eyes. But as we've grown into maturity, now we see things for what they are. And we go, oh, no, no, no. This is not truly the minute. No, this is pride and arrogancy. This is not the Holy Ghost. This is not the anointing. So we have to grow in discernment. And, and it comes by, you know, learning who the Lord is and learning what you know, speaking the truth in love, what, what, what true charity is. Okay, verse 12, if you would, Ed. All right, verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So try... So why spend time trying to focus our attention on those things that are not given to us to know? Let us focus on those things that are given to us. We are limited in what we can know because God is able to do more than we are capable of understanding. Ephesians 3.20 Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, he can do abundantly above all that we ask or think. Shouldn't we wait until we shall be in glory? And when shall we have the capacity to understand more? Then we will have the capacity to comprehend much more. So exactly. It's like, look, we see through a glass darkly. We're only knowing part because he's able to do far more than we could ever imagine. I mean, it's like, let's not worry about what he can do or, or you know, what, what. Let's just know that eventually we'll be given a much greater capacity of comprehension. But right now, let's focus our attention on what is important in God's eyes for us to know. This is what chapter 13 is trying to stress to us here. Okay, pick it up in verse 13. Ed. Verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Faith is very important. Hebrews 11:6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And there is only one way to obtain faith, Romans 10:17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But although faith is important, it is not the most important thing, contrary to what is taught by the word of faith teachers. And hope is important. Romans 15:4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So the source of our hope is whatsoever things were written aforetime. It is through patience and comfort of the scriptures. So as with faith, hope is obtained through the study of the scriptures. Romans 8:24 For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And what Paul is saying is that look, faith faith and hope are important. They're just not the most important thing. Again, it's about priorities. And yet, so many 
teachers now are saying that faith is the most important thing. Of course, they're the false teachers because here clearly you see the Word of God is not emphasizing that. It's not to say that faith is not important, but it is not the most important thing. And you just can't get around it. And how do you, you know, we can obtain more faith and we can obtain hope, and it comes through study of the scriptures. These things were written for, for our learning, you know, that we would learn it. You, you, you have to learn about faith and you have to learn about hope through the scriptures. But let's go on here to the other thing that really does matter. You pick it up here. So hope is important, but it is not the most important thing. Paul has clearly stated that the greatest of these is charity. And yet so many preachers and teachers don't stress this enough. Let's get our priorities right. God has told us what the priority is. First Timothy 4, 1, 4 through 6. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned from which some, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling. The bottom line is, if the motive for our actions is not the love of God, then I am nothing, verse 2. It profiteth me nothing, verse 3. If we don't get the love of God perfected in us, nothing else we do will count. And the only way to have this happen is this, 1 John 2, 5. But whatsoever, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Let us be obedient to his word. What am I going to wrap this up by? Verse 2, verse 3. I am nothing and it profiteth me nothing. If if it's not the love of God, if it's not getting to know him and have his love perfected in our hearts, none of this other stuff matters. It will not matter because in the end, we don't want to be like those that stand before the Lord on the last day saying, but Lord, we did lots of miracles. We Didn't we heal the sick? Didn't we do this? Didn't we do all these mighty works in your name? What does it profit if you don't know him, if you haven't had the love of God perfected in your hearts? So what I'm saying to you, brethren, is that we have a lot of individuals that are planted in our midst, the tares that the enemy has planted in our midst that are telling us that we're to be preoccupied with the faith. The word of faith, oh, that's the most important. And the gifts, that's the most. That is not what the word of God is saying to us. Brethren, let's not be like those on the last day that are having to, to question God and say, well, yeah, but what? I thought, I thought faith was the most important. You know, I thought that it's about having the love of God perfected in our hearts. And we play a role. It's not going to happen automatically. God is wanting to do it. And what does he say? How does it happen? It's as simple as 1 John 2, 5. If you keep his word, the love of God is going to be perfected in you. If you be obedient to the things that he teaches you out of his word, not trying to figure out all the mysteries, not trying to understand. It's about being obedient to what he teaches you. Put it into practice, and the love of God will be slowly perfected in your hearts to the point that you won't fear. You won't fear when the trials and tribulations come. I used to fear when I was younger. I used to think, oh, my God, I will never last. I told you the story about reading Fox's Book of Martyrs. I went and cried my eyes out. I said, God, just kill me now because I'm going to fail you. I, I can't endure that kind of stuff. Well, now I've grown in the Lord. Have I had to go through it? No. But what I have learned is that God is my provider. He's the one. He will give me the grace when I need it, not before I need it,
but when I need it. All that has come to me as I've learned about him, grown to know him, what he's capable of, what I mean to him. These are the things. It's, it's prioritizing things. Anybody like to add anything more as we get ready to close out tonight? Okay, is anybody awake out there? Besides me and Ed. <laughs> you got okay. a strong this week. <laughs> okay, well, that's okay. The others can listen on the recording. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, brethren, I just, you know, again, I just point out to us that, that this is really the important thing. Uh, and yet there's so many voices out there that are trying to, you know, get us off track. Uh, to, to concentrate on the things that really aren't that important. I know they are in the Word of God, but they're not the most important thing. It's like God wants to know, you know, in your studies, what have you determined that is the most important thing? And the most important thing, I'll reiterate it, is back here we read it in Jeremiah uh, 9 and, uh, oh, no, not, not back here, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glory, glory in this, that he understands me and knows me, and that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Not in all these other distractions. Even though they're part of the word of God, they take us away from the, the main thing which we can't allow to happen. Okay, anybody want to add anything more before we close it out tonight? Okay. Well, God willing, we'll go on into the uh, the next chapter, which, you know, is going to be about tongues. I think there's a lot of things in that chapter that we can help to uh, to clarify some of the arguments that have been put against uh, speaking in tongues. I, th I think we can, we'll be able to, you know, narrow that down. I don't think we'll get through the whole chapter in one week, but it, it should be pretty good. So anything else? Anybody want to add any last thing before we close in prayer? Okay, who would like to close us in prayer tonight? Well, I think you better close that. It's just me and you. Okay, uh, all right. I'll open it up. And John O and Mike don't usually participate in these things. Okay. Well, I know that John O, you know, he he tends to not want to pray in English because, you know, he, he doesn't feel like he knows it that good. But, yeah. John o, I just want to encourage you, John O. I've always enjoyed it when you pray in English. So don't ever hesitate to, and God will bless you. But I'll go ahead and close this in prayer tonight. And, uh, and I appreciate you, brethren. Again, we always need at least two or three to get together uh, to have in, in our midst. So I appreciate those that, that get on. And, and by the grace of God, we can, you know, take these things and communicate them to other people. That, If there's any hope that I have is that whatever the Lord gives me to share, others will share it with others to provoke people to get into the word and learn it for themselves. That That's really the bottom line. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I love you tonight, God. I'm so thankful for you, for your precious spirit, sweet spirit of the living God. There is nothing that we can do without you, Lord. We owe you so much, and it's beyond owing you because we, we can't pay it back, Lord. We're just thankful. Thankful that you dwell in us, Lord, that you quicken us, that you teach us. Without that, Lord, we would just be at the mercy of of wicked men and, and the powers of darkness, Lord. That would just but thank you for your word, God. Thank you for your presence, for your spirit to teach us and guide us into all truth. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would look at all the families represented on the call tonight, not just those who are actively in the call, but you know many others that will be listening to the, these recordings and that regularly are on the call. Please look at all of those families represented. I pray that you would touch hearts, Lord. Those of our family members that are not serving you, Lord, I pray that you would have first have mercy upon them and protect them. 
and I pray that you would also deal with their hearts day and night. Send people into their path. Help draw them back and draw others to you, Lord. And for those that are serving you, of all the families represented, bless them, Lord. Lord, help us. Establish us in the faith. Help us to know you better, God, to be pleasing to you, Lord. We want to be a blessing first to you, and then we want to be a blessing to others, Lord. Please help us, mighty God, because it, we're, we're not able to do this in our own strength. But we do love you. Thank you for all your promises, Lord. God, we just hope that uh, we brought joy to you in speaking the truth tonight amongst ourselves. Again, we love you and appreciate you. And in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Let me uh, close out the recording here. Okay. Okay.